It really is safe to leave your manuscript that's laying around on some pew. I think that Dave looked at my manuscript last night. I don't know how he got in my car. But he said that sometimes brethren will say the author of Hebrews or the Hebrew writer writes, etc. So whenever you hear me say those phrases today, just substitute Paul for that. <laughs> I understand how Brother Gibbons came to look at my manuscript. I had the manuscript on the pew this morning. And he leaned over and he said, I looked at your manuscript and I noticed some wording. Shout here, point wheat. <laughs> As I look out over the crowd, I'm not sure if I see melancholy faces or not. Within your mind, you're wondering whether or not I will take up the entire hour. Well, I do not want you to worry about it. I want your minds to be relaxed. I want you to be able to listen attentively. You're absolutely right. I will. As we prepare our minds for the study of God's word, I would like for us to approach our Heavenly Father in prayer. May we pray. Our Father and our God, we do come before you with thankful hearts, praising you for the blood of Jesus. We thank you, Father, that you have made this meeting available to us to come together and to share the message about Jesus, our Savior. I pray at this time, Father, that you would be with me and give me an understanding of the things that I have studied and may that I share them in such a way with my brothers and sisters in Christ that you will be glorified. We pray this in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I invite you to turn to the 26th chapter of the book of Matthew. And I would like for you to look at verse 28. And here Matthew records for us the words of our Lord Jesus Christ in which our Lord said, For this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins. I want you to be able to understand to a greater extent perhaps than you presently understand something of the greatness of Christ's statement on that occasion. In order to really and truly appreciate the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, I think it would be profitable for you if I share with you the historical background of this meeting. Our Lord said this within the context of a Passover meal. The Passover, as it was observed in the time of Christ, had a number of additions that were not present in the original Passover called the Egyptian Passover. In the time of our Lord, they did not sit around a table as we do in our tradition when we come together to break bread, but rather they reclined. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all state that they were reclining around a table. During the Passover in the time of Jesus, Four different times during this ritual, they filled their cups four times. The first time they filled their cups, it was called the cup of consecration. 
they thanked God that God had consecrated or sanctified the nation of Israel for himself. The second time they filled their cups, it was called the cup of proclamation. It was at that point of the ceremony in which the host shared with those present the story of God's redemption for the nation of Israel. Following the eating of the Passover lamb, they fill their cups a third time. That filling was called the cup of blessing. It was called the cup of blessing because at that point in the ceremony, a longer blessing ensued than any of the other cups. But the third cup also had another name. It was called the cup of redemption. And it was the third cup that also represented the blood of the Paschal Lamb. And it was this cup that was the most appropriate for our Lord to introduce or institute his supper. When Jesus took the third cup, the cup of redemption, the cup that represented the blood of the Paschal Lamb, Jesus said, This is my blood of the new covenant. Following the third drinking, they filled their cups a fourth time. And that cup was called the cup of Hallel, the cup of praise. As you read the accounts of Matthew, Mark, you will discover that Matthew and Mark do not identify the particular cup that our Lord used. Luke and Paul are the only two that specifically tell us that it was the third cup. They both state the cup after supper. That means after the eating of the Passover lamb. Luke is the only one that mentions two of the four cups utilized in the Passover meal. Paul is the only one of the writers that gives us the specific name assigned to the cup called the cup of blessing. And with this historical background in mind, this should enable us to appreciate to a greater extent the redemption that our Lord Jesus Christ accomplished for us in the shedding of his blood. Amen. Whenever you read Matthew and Mark, you will find that the words are like this. This is my blood of the new covenant. In Luke and Paul, the phraseology is a little different. It is this cup is the New Testament in my blood. Recently, in reading a commentary in preparation for this meeting, I noticed that the commentator translated Luke 22.20 as this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. I had never noticed that before, and I wondered why that this scholar would translate the verse that way. So I decided that I would look at the Greek text. If you look at an English translation, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. The participle in English modifies its nearest noun. 
you would think that it was modifying blood. But in Greek syntax, the participle modifies the noun that is in the same case, the same gender, and the same number. And what I observed was that the participle is an attributive participle in Greek. An attributive participle is adjectival in nature. And since it is adjectival, it must modify a noun. But it must modify a noun that is the, of the same case, of the same number, and of the same gender. The Greek word poterion is the only noun in the sentence that the present passive participle could modify. After understanding the Greek text, I looked at the New American Standard and the New Revised Standard, and both translations translate this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. I wanted to give you this historical background very briefly to set the stage for the sacrificial language that we will be looking at today in our study of Matthew 26, 28. I should state up front that this clause, this is my blood of the New Testament or of the New Covenant, is pregnant and rich with historical background and meaning. It is through the blood of the covenant that Jesus is able to accomplish for man what man cannot accomplish for himself, Amen. namely eternal redemption. Amen. Deliverance from condemnation is brought about through the blood of the Son of God. Paul sets forth the power of the blood when he wrote to the Christians at Ephesus. He said, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Redemption includes everything God does for the sinner. Amen. In salvation, two things stand out prominently in the mind of every believer. One, the forgiveness of sins and two, redemption of the body from the grave. Amen. Each Amen. believer is an illustration of the power of the blood of the Son of God. Amen. It is through the virtue of the blood that God raised our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. It is through the blood of Christ that Christians are raised from the dead. Amen. I think that the Hebrew writer forcefully anchored this truth in the heart of the believers when he said, Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will. Amen. Working in you what is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. It is the blood of Jesus that we are discussing in this meeting. There is power in the blood. Amen. It is the blood that makes us complete. The blood enables us to every good work. It is the blood 
that opens the way to heaven. It opens the way for all who believe in God's Messiah. In addition to these helps and benefits, the blood of Jesus opens the grave and it destroys the power of death and the power of Satan and the power of hell. The author of Hebrews artfully captures the essence of the blood of Christ when he writes, not with the blood of bulls and of goats, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. It is his blood that is the answer to man's redemption. The Holy Spirit, through the same writer, gives prominent place to the blood of our Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. Listen as we read from Hebrews 12, 22 through 24. He says, But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn Mm -hmm. who are registered in heaven, to the God and judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. It is the speaking of the blood of Jesus that keeps heaven open for sinners. And it is the blood of Jesus that sends the spiritual blessings from heaven upon sinful man. The throne of grace owes its existence to the precious blood of the Lamb of God. Christians must never forget that redemption is through the blood of God's anointed one. Peter expresses it this way in 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19. He says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your sinless conduct received, by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. As long as heaven lasts, the praises of the blood will sound forth from heaven itself. No wonder John writes for us in Revelation 5, 9 when he talks about the four living creatures and the 24 elders. He said, And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seal. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Isn't this enough to make us want to shout hallelujah and praise God? You know, the Old Testament abounds with illustrations set in forth the utter destruction of sin and God's forgiveness and rejoicing over this. God reminds Israel in Isaiah the 44th chapter in verse 22, he says, I have blotted out like a thick cloud your transgression and like a cloud of your sins. Return to me for I have redeemed you. 
And this part here, brethren, we need to read over and over and over again because God says to Israel, Sing, O heavens, Amen. for the Lord has done it. Amen. Shout, you lower parts of the earth. Amen. Break forth into singing, you mountains, O forest and every tree in it. Hallelujah. Listen. The salvation that we have is a great salvation. That reminds you of what Paul says. See, I did say it. (laughs) Doesn't it in the Hebrew letter? How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Isaiah remarks again in 3817, He said, For you have cast all my sins behind your back. Micah says, He will again have compassion on us, will subdue our iniquity. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. God tells Jeremiah, I will cleanse them from all their iniquity by which they have sinned against me. I will pardon all their iniquities by which they have sinned and by which they have transgressed against me. Amen. But now you're waiting for the other prophecy, aren't you? And if I were to ask you what that prophecy is that I am about to refer to, every one of you could tell me, couldn't you? Jeremiah 31. You remember that God said, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. I'm wondering today, if I were to ask each of you to write out on a sheet of paper what is the superiority of the new covenant over the old What would you write? What actually stands out in your mind that is really superior to the old? Well, God tells Jeremiah what it really is. And I would to God that every one of us that are here today, we have all been redeemed, and we need to understand what it is. And listen to what God says. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin will I remember no more. Amen. Now that is enough to make a shout, isn't it? Amen. The forgiveness of sins is what Paul details in the book of Romans. Now Jeremiah tells us the fact. I will forgive their iniquities and their sins will I remember no more. But thank God that Paul the Apostle comes along and he tells us the how. He explains the fact. Paul writes about this matchless love of God, this unfathomable mercy in this wonderful holiness of God. And as one reads about this love and this mercy and this holiness, one must stand in awe of the God we serve. Amen. In Romans 3, 23 through 26, Paul bursts forth with rapturous language in describing the method God employs to justify man, and yet at the same time exonerates God's holiness in his actions. Listen to Paul. You've heard the scriptures several times during this meeting. It doesn't hurt to read it again. He said, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. What does it mean to be justified freely? 
The word freely there comes from the Greek word on. And do you remember the words that our Lord said as recorded by John in 1525? He said, they hated me without a cause. The words without a cause is from the rayon. Being justified freely without a cause should cause us to bow in humble reverence yes. to the God Amen. of heaven. Since God is holy, God has to deal with sin in a way that his holiness is not questioned. Amen. And so Paul says that God accomplished all of this by setting forth Jesus as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier Amen. of the one that believes in Jesus. Well, what does propitiation mean to you? Well, if we were to look at the Hebrew, and this was mentioned, I believe, by one or two brothers earlier, we talk about to atone the word kapar. But there is a noun form that is kaporeth, which is translated mercy seat. It is translated cover. It is translated lead. It is translated throne of grace. What am I talking about? Well, you look at the book of Leviticus, and this word is used 16 times in Leviticus 16. It says, easy to remember, just think, I believe, one young man here is 16, Leviticus 16, 16 times. But the mercy seat in the most holy place was a... Helosterion, and that is exactly the word that Paul uses, that God set him forth as a Helosterion, a propitiation, a mercy seat. He is our atonement. Amen. And that is how that God is able to justify sinful man when he accepts Jesus as his atonement for his transgressions. God's righteous wrath against sin is an outward manifestation of his holiness. Amen. God Amen. cannot allow sin to go unpunished. Amen. Justice demands retribution. Thus, God devises a way to demonstrate his holiness. Amen. And yet, at the same time, justify sinful man. Yes. Amen. I should ask you now, what is God's solution to the problem? A propitiation by his blood mm -hmm. through faith. Amen. That is God's answer. This emancipation from God's redemption or this emancipation, rather, from God's wrath, this freedom from the dominion or power of sin, this deliverance from the curse of the law, this redemption from condemnation is so complete and so perfect that the sinner is looked upon 
is absolutely justified and righteous before God. Since Jesus is our wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, then Paul says, let him who glories Amen. glory in the Lord. Amen. It is to this view of complete forgiveness of sins that the penman of Hebrews informs us that there is nothing, nothing to prevent man approaching the throne of grace with the greatest of freedom. Yeah. Amen. He says, let us therefore approach the throne of grace. There is the mercy seat. Amen. With boldness, so that we may receive mercy yeah. and find grace to help in the time of need. Amen. How is this access accomplished? Again, the same author tells us that it is through the blood of Jesus. I believe that Paul senses the glory of the blood of Christ when he writes in Hebrews 10, 19 through 22, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter. And I want you to underscore that word to enter. We will return to it in a moment. To enter the holiness by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near. Amen. And I want you to underscore that. Enter and let us draw near Amen. with a true heart and full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Amen. Amen. Our right to draw near is affirmed by the blood of Jesus. Amen. He is our high priest. Yes. And since we are now priests of God, redeemed by the blood, Amen. the Holy Spirit encourages believers to approach God's throne. Amen. Even John, when our Lord rolls back the curtain of heaven, yeah. declares with transported joy to him who loved us yeah. and washed us from our sins Amen. in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. What does it really mean to draw near? What does it mean to you? What does it mean? Are these just words that we have read? No. That we have heard, quoted it down through the years? What does it mean? To draw near. To draw near is an act of worship. Mm -hmm. Worship in the New Testament is never identified with a so called Sunday morning worship service. Amen. Amen. Under the New Covenant, there are no prescribed outward rituals for divine worship, no. Amen. such as five acts to be performed in a fixed order or enacted in a certain manner. Amen. Amen. Nor is there a set hour for a worship service. Amen. 
Amen. You know, I just found out something that was very devastating to me this week. I found out that Brother Pat Kilpatrick does not own a watch. And I looked at him and I said, Well, Pat, if you don't own a watch, how are you going to know when to start worshiping and when to quit? <laughs> you see, the words to draw near was used in reference to animal sacrifices. When the offerer took the animal, he had to draw near. And this is what God is telling us. See, they understood this, what it meant to draw near, to come near to God, to offer your sacrifice. It is true that Christians are to come together. I'm not saying that we are not because God commands that. But for what purpose? The purpose of believers coming together is never described as worship. Amen. I wrote an article on what is worship. I looked at every Greek word employed in the New Testament. I looked at its classical Greek usage. I looked at the Septuagint usage of the word and how it was employed in the New Testament. And what was amazing to me in my research that not one of those words were ever associated with the gathering of the saints. Amen. Never. Amen. 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 We come together as we have done on this occasion because we are worshipers yes. of the Most High God. Yes. Amen. 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 We don't start worship at nine and quit at ten. We come together to strengthen and encourage one another in the faith, lest some depart from the faith. Yes. Amen. Hasn't this meeting been a meeting of encouragement and spiritual strength? Amen. Amen. This is what God intended. We come together yes. to put a fire under one another, to fill up on high octane so that we can go out and share the good news of Jesus. Yes that God has provided a way of salvation. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man can come unto the Father except through me. Amen. The act of worship in the New Testament is what? What is it? You know, don't you? Yes. But in our drawing there, what do we do? We present our bodies as living sacrifices, which is our spiritual Amen. act of worship. Yes. Amen. Yes. When I was preparing to write my article on the subject of worship, our reviewed an article written by a brother who objected to Romans 12 being translated your spiritual act of worship. And his argument seemed rather sound. And I said, well, there must be some reason why the translators, many of them translate that not your reasonable service, but rather your spiritual act of worship. And what I discovered was that the words employed by Paul were sacrificial words related to sacrifice. And so Paul said, present your bodies a living sacrifice, which is your spiritual act of worship. Whatever we do to his glory and honor becomes our spiritual offering. In this way, all our actions become thank offerings to God. Amen. Our life is to be one of complete consecration to God. Amen. The phrase, let us draw near, conveys the idea of sacrifice. The word enter 
is a priestly word, at least in this context. Christians as priests approach the throne of God's grace through the blood of Jesus. Since Christ has entered the holy place through his own blood, Christians are encouraged to come before the throne of grace. Once more, the writer of Hebrews explains the significance and the efficacy of the blood of Jesus. He said, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal, eternal redemption. For at the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies the purified of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God? Amen. Praise God for the blood. Amen. It is the blood of Christ that possesses the power to cleanse us and to make us fit to serve the living God. In some manner, this offering up of Jesus as sacrifice is done through the eternal spirit who was in Jesus our Lord. It appears that the Holy Spirit lived and worked in that blood so that when it was shed, it would be a living blood and could ascend to heaven as it were to exercise its divine power from there. Amen. How? I don't know. The Word of God states it. And I believe it. Amen. In our relationship to God as priests, there is no offering that Christian can bring other than a belief in honoring the blood of the Lamb of God in one's daily walk with God and his fellow man. Amen. Every act that a Christian performs in response to Jesus as Lord is an act of worship that honors the blood of Christ. In the Old Testament, it was the duty of priests to offer up sacrifices or attend to everything that was essential for ministry in the house of God. But in the New Testament, every Christian is a living sacrifice, Amen. which is his spiritual act of worship. Amen. For the believer, his or her service, is not in rituals performed Sunday morning. Amen. It is in the Messianic age a life of devotion to the God of heaven, to the King of kings, Amen. and to the Lord of lords. Amen. I think that Leon Morris expresses himself extremely clear in this area. He said to see Christ as having offered the perfect sacrifice that brings salvation is not to enter a realm of cheap grace. That's right. It does not mean that we offer no sacrifice. It means that our sacrifice is of a different order. Amen. It is not atoning but a costly response to a sacrifice that is atoning. Amen. Paul speaks of himself as being made a sacrifice in the service of other Christians. Mm -hmm. And he refers to the gift of the Philippian Christians that they sent to him as a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God in Philippians 4.18. The writer of Hebrews refers to a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of the lips that confess his name, 
These are sacrifices that we are to offer. When one presents his or her body a living sacrifice, that involves a vertical as well as a horizontal relationship to God and to man. Amen. Yeah. Amen. God's grace teaches his children that they are to be obedient yeah. unto his law. Amen. Amen. Ungodliness and worldly lust we deny because this is yeah. what grace teaches us. Yeah. Because of what God has done for us, his law is written on our hearts and in our minds. And we do it because we are sons and daughters of Almighty God. We are grateful. One must never forget that life is in the blood. Now, I need to take... Well, let's just... I've got, what, to 1045? Is that when my time ends? Well, I'm taking it. <laughs> you know, I get so excited about what God has accomplished for us, it's difficult for me to keep my mouth shut. Amen. Amen. This is rich for me. Amen. I tell you, this meeting has helped me, I think, more than any meeting that I have been to because I have a greater appreciation for the blood of Jesus yes. than I have ever had before. Yes. Amen. I said that one must never forget that life is in the blood. And to set the tone for a deeper meaning of the Lord's words about the blood of the new covenant, one must reflect on the history behind the phrase. You remember this, don't you? Life of the flesh is in the blood. the blood. What does that mean? Moses told the Israelites that the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement yes. Amen. for your souls. And it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Amen. Without blood, there can be no life. Without the blood of Jesus, there can be no eternal life for man. Amen. Now, I think Jesus confirms the validity of what Moses said in John 6. You've all heard this many times, but listen again. Our Lord said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, that unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, Amen. you have no life in you. Amen. Amen. This context appears to teach that faith, is the means whereby one appropriates the flesh and blood of the Son of God. Amen. It is through faith that one lays claim to God's appointed sacrifice. Amen. In other words, Jesus is the crucified one as well as the source of life, and without the shedding of his blood, there could be no life. That's why that Jesus said, this is my blood of the new covenant that is being poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Mm -hmm. There are so many scriptures here that we could refer to, like Hebrews 9, 14 through 15. But may I remind you that the shedding of the blood in the Old Testament looked forward to the coming of the final sacrifice, Amen. the sacrifice of Jesus. Yes. This was what it was all about. 
even the mercy seat in the most holy place. It prefigured Jesus Christ, God's helosterion, God's atonement for the sins of man. Again, the Hebrew writer says, But this man, after he had offered up one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Amen. The Old Testament foreshadowed the coming one sacrifice for the salvation of man. For instance, the Scripture declares in Hebrews 10.1, For the law, having a shadow, of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. The real versus the shadow is clearly expressed by the Holy Spirit. Amen. I think that an understanding of this concept will assist one in his or her apprehension of the real thing. Amen. Amen. We've heard something like that before happen. We about a drink, the real thing. I'm not sure, but it seems like I've heard that. Well, Jesus is the real thing. Amen. This is what the writer is telling us about. An awareness of the Old Testament shadows is indispensable to a proper sensitivity of redemption Amen. by the blood of Christ in the New Testament. Amen. Amen. Now, Brother Kilpatrick some time ago wrote a series of articles on the Lord's Supper, some of the finest I have ever read. And I picked up a couple of quotes from him. And as I was sharing this with him, he said, where did I write that? I think it even shocked Pat. I want you to listen to Brother Pat as he points out an excellent portrait of the redemptive drama set forth on the stage of the Old Testament in Tights and Shatters. This is what Brother Pat says. He says that the Old Testament is the stage upon which the redemptive drama is preformed. It is essential that the Christian system be seen against this kind of background. The greatest lesson in the Old Testament on the true meaning of gospel is seen in the Exodus. In fact, the Exodus is the very heart of the Old Testament. Exodus dominates the skyline of the Old Testament history. Yes, it towers over the consciousness of Israel for all time to come. Yes, amen. It, in this, all future history is understood in light of that event. The deliverance becomes a pattern for all future deliverances. Yeah. Amen. And again, he writes about a visible screen on which to portray spiritual images. Listen, just as Israel had her signs and seals that provided the framework for remembering their redemption from Egyptian slavery, namely the feast days with all of their trimmings regulated by the ordinance, in the Christian age, it is still essential that we have a visible screen on which to portray spiritual images. When we sit down to eat, we realize that he is our true bread and our living bread. Amen. Amen. You know, Brother Kilpatrick has pointed out rather visibly that our visible screen is in the eating of bread and drinking of wine in the Lord's Supper. Yes. Now, I don't have time to lecture for an hour on the covenant. In fact, 
You will not believe this, but I left ten pages at least of my manuscript in the car a while ago, and I blotted out, I think, 20 pages up here because I only have an hour. But I will say this, that it would be very profitable for you to study the word covenant. Amen. You will discover that in covenant that it was not uncommon for there to be witnesses to covenants. Not always a human being. Abraham and Abimelech. There were seven ewe lambs that were witnesses of the covenant that they had entered into. It was Jacob and Laban, if I remember correctly, that they built a heap of stones that was a witness to their covenant. And whenever we come together on the Lord's day and eat of the bread and drink of the cup, there is a living witness, as it were, Amen. to the redemption that God has brought about for us Amen. in His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I have five minutes. Amen. In this life's supper, one witnesses the drama set forth on the screen of the Old Testament. It was during that meal that Jesus said, this cup that is poured out for you. Oh, I wish we had the time today to talk about the sacrifices, the burn offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, the guilt offering, and see how that the blood of the bull was poured out at the basic of the altar. And Jesus said, this is my blood that is poured out for you. The Egyptian Passover, and I'll have to go through this rather hurriedly, but do you remember one of the things that happened in the Egyptian Passover? They killed the Paschal Lamb and they smeared the blood upon the doorpost and above the doorpost on the lintel. And God said what? When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Now they had firstborn in Egypt. They had firstborn in Goshen. Some died, some lived. What was the difference? Some were covered with the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Now, what about the believer today? You remember we quoted the scripture earlier that the Hebrew writer spoke of the firstborn ones? Aren't we the firstborn? Amen. Now, what is the difference between us and those outside the redemptive community of God? We are covered with the blood of the Lamb. Amen. And remember, God says, when I see the blood, Amen. I will pass over you. Amen. Amen. Brethren, I tell you this, I just get so excited about all this. Do you see the shatter, the tides, the antitides? We are the church of the firstborn ones. Amen. And I leave with you the words of our Lord. This is my blood of the new covenant being shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let us pray. Amen. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this privilege of being able to reflect upon your holy word. We pray, Father, that you would open our hearts to be receptive to the things that we have studied. And may the, the things that we have studied, the things that we have learned, 
that we use to your glory and to your honor. And we pray, Father, that the next brother that shares with us, Brother Leon, that you would bless him, Father, and be with him in a mighty way, Amen. that he can share with us a greater understanding of the unsearchable riches of Jesus. It is in his name that we do pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.